not necessarily those of radio station KMET, its management, employees, or affiliates. Hello listeners, Christopher here from The Christopher Show. Hey, I want to talk to you a little bit about CBD. Now, CBD is not approved by the FDA as of yet. Myself, as well as millions of other people across the USA, have used it with help for pain, anxiety, sleep, and other conditions. Now, you know, all CBD products are not equal. It really matters on where you get the CBD from. Now, I suggest you get it from a qualified pharmacist, and I happen to know of one. It's at your pharmacy and mobility solutions in Beaumont, California. They only carry pharmaceutical-grade CBD products of the highest quality. So if you want the best, you go to your pharmacy and mobility solutions. Their staff is there to help you with all your CBD, pharmacy, and mobility needs. They're located at 1680 East 6th Street in Beaumont, California. Give them a call, 951-845-8252. Once again, it's your pharmacy, mobility solutions in Beaumont, 951-845-8252. Once again, it's your pharmacy and mobility solutions in Beaumont, California, 951-845-8252. Applebee's in Beaumont is where you can order delivery online at Applebee's.com or you can pick up your food car side by ordering online and by phone. Enjoy Applebee's bold, savory grilled steaks, salmon, or chicken meals. Applebee's is located where Beaumont meets Banning, just off 6th Street near Highland Springs Avenue. Applebee's in Beaumont, offering car side to go or delivery when you order online. Go to Applebee's.com. That's Applebee's in Beaumont at Applebee's.com. Make it Applebee's tonight. 1490 AM Smart Talk Radio, KMET. Banning, Beaumont, and Redlands. From ABC News. I'm Daria Albinger. It's been a year since George Floyd was killed while in the custody of now former Minneapolis police officers. Today, there were musical performances at a street festival at the intersection where Floyd died along with moments of silence today. There was a march in Floyd's memorial in Boston, a vigil in Philadelphia, and a balloon release in Houston where Floyd was born. President Biden invited members of Floyd's family to the White House, including his brother, Philonis. If you can make federal laws to protect the bird, which is the bald eagle, you can make federal laws to protect people of color. Congress is continuing slow progress on a police reform bill. There is cause for optimism on the Hill. Negotiators have said that they see a bipartisan framework emerging. Now, they aren't getting into the details of what this deal looks like, and it's clear there are still some major sticking points. First and foremost, this question of qualified immunity, which shields officers from civil lawsuits, but they are at least making strides. ABC's Mary Bruce. Negotiations also continue on an infrastructure proposal, Republicans plan to present their latest counteroffer Thursday morning. Senate Democrats saying if GOPs will not compromise, they'll go it alone. The last COVID relief bill passed with no Republican Senate votes. Normally, that would kill the bill, but Democrats used an arcane, just 51 votes needed reconciliation rule to get it done. They may do it again. It has always been our plan, uh, regardless of the vehicle, uh, to work on an infrastructure bill in July. Majority Leader Chuck Schumer saying he wants to work with Republicans, but again, may not have to. Andy Field, ABC News, Washington. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office has impaneled a special grand jury to consider indictments against former President Trump and his company. The CDC says half of U.S. adults are now fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Stocks closed slightly lower today. The Dow down just over 80 points. You're listening to ABC News. From the KMET Weather Center for Beaumont, Banning and the Pass area. This afternoon, it's going to be mostly sunny, bit of a breeze, high 88, winds gusting to 25 miles per hour. A partly cloudy night tonight, low 60. Sunny skies Wednesday, high 84. For Redlands this afternoon, we'll see a sunny sky with temperatures near 90. Palm Springs, plenty of sunshine, high 98. I'm meteorologist Jim Minaldi for Smart Talk 1490 KMET. A show where you can actually have all of your legal questions answered for free by a law firm with 40 years experience? Are you kidding me? What could be better than that? That's the WK Law Power Hour, 1490 KMET, every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Get your legal questions answered, great guests, watch or listen, you won't regret it. We look forward to seeing you there. The following is a paid program. Views and claims expressed are those of the program producer and are not endorsed by this station. Opinions expressed are not necessarily those of radio station KMET, its management, employees, or affiliates.
The WK Law Power Hour is here to take you from zero to hero in legal knowledge in 60 minutes. A law firm with 40 years of experience is ready to give you legal guidance you need for free. What could be better than that? Amazing stories about actual cases, interesting and informative guests. Listen, watch, call in. Come ready to learn. And now your host for WK Law Power Hour, Paul Wallen. Welcome, everybody. This is Paul Wallen, the WK Law Power Hour. This is our second show, and everyone at Wallen and Claridge is excited to have you join our journey. The first show was a major success. So many people watched, so many people watched it on tape, and obviously we wanted to keep rolling. I'm Paul Wallen. I've been a lawyer for 43 years. I know I look way too young to be a lawyer for 43 years, but I cannot tell a lie. That's the truth. Our firm was formed in 1981, well before most of you people were born. We have helped over 250,000 people with their legal problems over the years. We started with one small office in Orange County, and now we have many offices, Riverside, San Bernardino, LA, and Orange County. And this is the part of the show where I want to take your calls to educate you and people listening. 951-922-3532. We're going to be taking calls until 315, and we're also going to be taking calls at the end of the show. But in the middle of the two shows, you can also email me at pjw at wklaw.com. That's pjw at wklaw.com, and we could get your questions there. You can also go live on TikTok. I'm on live right now. Or you can email me a question on TikTok at, at Beach Lawyer Paul. We are so lucky to have two great guests um, for two great conversations today. The first is my brilliant law partner, John Lynn, who's going to talk about the child dependency system. How does a parent get their children taken away by the state? Not enough food, not enough shelter, physical abuse, domestic violence, so many ways. And many people don't understand how tough the dependency system is. And you're going to get education in case you know someone that has their kids taken away, how they can get their kids back. And our second guest, another brilliant lawyer, Michael Carrillo, who specializes in representing sex, uh, people that have been victimized a sex crime, people that are victims of sexual abuse or police misconduct. And when you get answers to his questions, that will be very, very, very good for you guys to know, because if you know someone who's been the victim of sexual abuse, you can find out what they can do. When can they sue? How much can they sue for? What are their chances of winning? Same thing when uh, someone you know gets beat up by the police. You might think it's hopeless and you can't recover, but in fact, in many cases, you can recover. So that's why I'm so, so interested in, in getting both of those people to be on the show with us. Many times, people, oh, Lorraine, how you doing? How can I help you, dear? Hi, Attorney Paul. I have a quick question for you, if I may. I was sure. cited for speeding by CHP on my way to Las Vegas. The officer wrote me up for going 90, and I know I was not going faster than 75. How can I fight the ticket? Okay, Lorraine, I have some bad news for you. The bad news is that the law in California no matter what freeway you're on, is never faster than 70 miles an hour. So even if the officer wrote you up for 90, if you're, if you're, if you're admitting to going over 70, it means you are G-U-I-L-T-Y guilty. Mm -hmm. So what can you do? What you can do is you can hire, if you want to hire our firm, because who wants to drive out far in the desert? Is it, is it the Barstow Court you're going to? Yes, and that's 100 miles away from my home. Exactly. So many people who have a job kids they want to not go out there let alone twice so they hire us to take care of it and why is that because we can go out to court and we can first of all hope the officer doesn't show and in a high number of cases the officer doesn't show and if the officer doesn't show guess what we win we're heroes you win you pay nothing no increase in your car insurance no point on your dmv it's a it's a it's a victory and if the police officer does show we can ask the judge for traffic school and if the judge grants it, which you probably will if you haven't gone in the last 18 months, you will not have an increase in your car insurance and you won't have a point on your record. So that's why many people hire us and also they don't want to drive out to Barstow. 
So that's how that works. Any other questions about that, dear? No, that's all. I'll be contacting your office. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for calling. So um, what I want to talk about um, is the different kind of cases that I have handled and the stories that I'll be able to talk to you guys on this show, as well as a podcast that's going to be coming up. I have represented people accused of every serious crime, from murder to sex offenses to robbery. And the backstory that I'll be able to tell you guys now that those cases are over is really fascinating. Um, the crazy things that a criminal defense attorney has to learn about and die with because of our confidentiality. Um, we had one case in Orange County where a person was accused of planting biological weapons in his backyard. And I happened to live in that same city and had neighbors who were obviously freaking out to no end. And obviously they wanted to find out, are they really there? Are they not there? And of course, I have an ethical obligation to keep my mouth shut. I could not say anything. It was an extremely uncomfortable time. And on my podcast, I'll tell you the whole story, but I'll just tell you one thing about the story. I was on my way with my boys to Vegas, and I got a call from my law partner that I needed to rush out to the house. And I rushed out to the house, and I got up to the second floor, and I looked to the left, and I saw some horrible substance on the wall. And it turned out to be brain matter because our client had uh, committed suicide. That's just part of the story. And that's the kind of cases we handle and that we've been handling for many, many years, as crazy as it sounds. Um, legal knowledge is power. And the goal of our show is to take our viewers through a legal journey from zero to hero in legal knowledge. And what that means is pretty simple. It means that right now you probably don't have answers to critical questions that you'd like to have, and we'll provide those for you. So right now, if you're in a social setting and it comes up, what do I do if I have a traffic ticket? Or what do I do? Should I sign that contract? You know, nothing. But now you'll have knowledge. And so many specific examples I can point to in my personal experience where our clients who come to us often too late have gotten screwed. For example, what about if you or a loved one is going up against a criminal charge you don't know who to hire. You don't know how, what you do. Do you just get the public defender or do you seek out an experienced lawyer in that area of law? So many people don't know a lawyer. They don't know how to get a lawyer. And that's where Wallen and Claridge comes in because we have a referral program. We know hundreds of lawyers across the state who do what we do or different areas of law. And people often call us for a referral. And I do the same thing with my friends on TikTok. When they ask for a referral, they have a legal question. But many people who are pro charged with a crime get prosecuted and convicted, and they didn't even know what the elements of the crime were. And sometimes it's because they have a public defender. And the public defenders are very hardworking lawyers. But could you imagine a doctor who's really good doctor but he has 30 surgeries the same day. Would you want to be his last surgery of the day? That's sort of what it's like with a lot of public defenders. They have a very, very high caseload and they're dealing with very serious cases, sometimes with their clients facing many, many years in prison. You would probably want a lawyer that could dedicate a lot of time to the case and not just on the day in court. That's why it's important to know an experienced criminal defense law firm whether it's us or a, a law firm where you live, in your city, Northern California or another state. I know there's a lot of people watching who are from other states because I have a tremendous number of followers on TikTok, about almost 50,000, and I'd say 25% of them are from other states. So it's fascinating the different laws in those states, but primarily because this is station goes to Riverside, San Bernardino County, we have offices in Victorville, San Bernardino, thank you, sweetheart, and um, Riverside, San Bernardino, and Victorville. Three different offices that you can go to and call us at any time. The number is 877-466-5245, toll free. You can also go to www.wklaw.com and 
you can get literally, I think there's like 15,000 pages of information on that website. It's been going ever since websites were allowed, ever since lawyers were allowed to post those things. It's not just criminal law where people get, get messed up if they don't have legal experience. What I have found over the years, probably the one area of law where most uh, parents get disadvantaged is in child custody and visitation. If you don't understand the difference between primary legal custody and physical custody, you can't be successful in your case. And if you don't have a lawyer guiding you through the process of how a judge decides who to give physical custody to um, and who to give visitation to, how can you possibly prosecute your case successfully? That's why it's critical to have lawyers that are willing to help and where you get smart legal advice. And here's the best news of all. Our firm gives free phone consultations on anything that we do, and we do a lot of different stuff. And so if you were to call our office and you were facing a child custody matter and you didn't know what to do, and you were probably upset because you might lose your kids, and what's more critical than your kids, just call us and lay out your situation and we'll tell you what your options are. And if you have funds to hire us, great. And if not, okay, Amanda, how can I help you today, dear? Hi, Paul. Um, thank you for taking my call. Um, I had a situation with my mom at the DMV. Um, she's 62 years old. Um, she's in pretty good health, but she um, unfortunately fell in the shower and was unconscious for a little while. <clears throat> we had paramedics come in. Um, and <clears throat> Sorry, she was fine, but she didn't have to go to the hospital. Um, unfortunately, three weeks later, we received a letter from the DMV saying her driver's license is going mm. to be suspended. Um, so we're just wondering, we don't know what to do with that. Can they actually do that? And can we fight it? You know, we get so many calls. I would say we get five calls a day, multiply that times 250 work days. This is a, sure. This is a shocking thing. And, and what I'd like you to do is I'll talk, start talking about it and then we'll finish it up just briefly after the break. The bottom line is the DMV has a ton of power. And if they think you are unable to drive, if a, doctor or paramedic reports you, the DMV can send you a letter and can demand a hearing where you're going to need to get a doctor for your mom and go to a hearing and the doctor's going to have to say that she's not likely to pass out because, of course, she could kill someone driving if she passes out and herself. So right. these things happen shock in a shocking way. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. You can always does. call our office. You can always have her call our office because I know when you're getting to be older, you know, driving may be your last freedom, right? And God right. forbid she has to drive herself to the doctor's appointment and can't drive. It would really be an inconvenience for the family. So right. that would be a good answer for that. But if you need more information, just call us at 877-466-5245. Okay? Okay. Thank you so much, Paul. That's great advice. No problem. And now we're heading okay. into uh, commercials, and they're great commercials, so listen to them. You've been charged with a crime, and now you're facing the loss of your freedom. Where do you turn to get out of jail or stay out of jail? The law offices of Wallen and Claridge. Call 877-4-NO-JAIL. With over 20 years' experience and attorneys who work in your local courts, Wallen and Claridge can make the difference between jail and freedom. When you need help, make one call. Make it to Wallen and Claridge. 877-4-NO-JAIL. The call is free. Will you be? Hey, are you okay to drive? Yeah, I'm fine. 17, the central jail. If you've been arrested for DUI and are facing DMV in court hearings, it could mean losing your license, your job, and even your freedom. But Wallen and Claridge can help. Just call 877-4-NO-JAIL. With attorneys who know your local courts, Wallen and Claridge can make the difference between jail and freedom. Call Wallen and Claridge at 877-4-NO-JAIL. The call is free. Will you be? When your children are taken by social workers, it may be the worst day of your life. When will I see my children again? Where are they going? 
How can I get them back? Who can I turn to for help to end this nightmare? The answers to all these questions are a phone call or email away. Wallen and Clarish have been helping defend parents who are battling the system to regain custody of their children for 40 years. Many of their clients have done nothing wrong to warrant their children being taken from them. Other clients may regret some action that they've taken with their children. However, in every case, the clients desperately need their children back. That's where Wallen and Clarich comes in. They know the dependency system. They will do all they can to work to try to get your children back with you. Take the first step and call Wallen and Clarish now for a free phone consultation at 877-466-5245. That's 877-466-5245. Or visit WKLaw.com to chat with us. They'll be there when you call. If you are facing criminal charges, your entire future is at stake. You need to act now to protect your job, your family, and your freedom. Call Wallen and Clarich at 877-4NO-JAIL. Wallen and Clarich has over 30 years of experience in fighting for our clients' rights. With local offices in Riverside and San Bernardino, we are here to help you now. Call 877-4NO-JAIL or go to WKLaw.com. How much is your freedom worth? Call 877-466-5245. The call is free. Will you be? When you have a warrant for your arrest, it's a very scary time in your life. When you drive a car, you have to be extra careful that you do not commit any sort of moving violation. You have to be looking over your shoulder checking for police officers. Will you be stopped and thrown in jail? What a horrible feeling. For over 40 years, we have helped thousands of persons resolve their problem with having a warrant. In some cases, we can actually appear in court for you without you being present to recall the warrant. Depending on the facts of your case, you may never have to do one minute in jail. Stop living in fear. Call us now for a free phone consultation at 877-4-NO-JAIL. That is 877-4-NO-JAIL. Or go to WKLaw.com. Isn't it time to get your life back? We will be there when you call. Hi guys, we're back. And now I have the honor to introduce John Lynn, who is a brilliant lawyer. John, how you doing? I'm great. How about you, Paul? Um, I'm great. I love this show. How long have you been a lawyer? How long have I been a lawyer? I passed the bar in March of 2009 in the state of Florida. I've been an attorney for 12 years uh, in Florida, and then I moved over to California. 2013, been an attorney for eight years here in California. And could you tell us a little about your educational background? Sure. Uh, I went to college at USC, and then I went to law school at the University of Minnesota, and uh, just didn't want to live in the cold anymore, so I moved out <laughs> after that. Okay. And you have uh, uh, been with uh, our law firm, Wallen & Claridge, for how many years now? Since 2013, about eight and a half years. Wow, that's a long time. Really, it's that long. Just flew um, by. <laughs> can you talk about the different areas of law that you handle for our firm, the different kind of cases? Sure. I handle, I would say, about 80% are serious felony crimes, people accused of serious crimes, um, murders, uh, drug cases, and about 20% are child dependency cases that I handle where people have their kids taken away or they're facing having their kids taken away. Okay, let, and that's what I'd like to talk about, um, about the child dependency system. Can you talk about um, what happens when uh, children are taken from their parents? How are they taken? Under what circumstances? So there's a few different ways that could happen. Um, one situation could be a parent's in the hospital and they've just given birth and they find out that the child's tested positive for drugs and they, because the parent was taking drugs. They might take the child right from the hospital. You could have a situation where there's domestic violence in the home. So maybe the mother calls and the parents, the police show up and they see that there's been some domestic violence around the kids and um, that case gets referred to the social worker. There might be a situation where a kid is being physically abused or sexually abused and they report it to a teacher in school. That teacher is a mandated reporter. They have to tell social services. So in those situations, social services comes and it could be in the middle of the night. They have a, an order from the judge to take a child and your child's taken from your home. It's a very serious situation that someone's looking at. Wow. 
So one thing that really is interesting, a lot of people don't know. So if you're at home with your significant other and you have young children in the home and there's a fight that breaks out, it could be screaming, people could throw a plate or something, that's enough and the kids could be taken from you, right? It could be, yeah, it could be enough. And it doesn't have to be that somebody struck the child or did anything to the child. It's the fact that you have a child in this home where there's there's violence and that could be unhealthy for the child. So that's something that you might have to look at going to court and, and dealing with that issue in court. And in many cases, these children have never been away from their parents even a day, right? That's That's the tough thing about these dependency cases is that you might have a situation where you have a mother or father who have never been separated from a child for 24 hours. And then all of a sudden now they're put into foster care or a group home or a situation that's just completely different from what they were in before. So these are very difficult cases for the children and uh, the parents that are going through dependency. I've, I've obviously also handled these cases for like 40 years. And that's the worst part of these cases for me. People don't understand that it's a balancing Social workers look at a possible problem and they take children away. And sometimes that's not the best alternative. There's alternatives other than that because of the trauma that children go to. They're sleeping in a stranger's home. They don't know anyone there. There's tears. There's just, it's, it's a horribly uncomfortable situation. Now, what happens after the children are taken from the parents? Um, when is the next time the parents even see the child? So if your child is taken... Uh, pursuant to an order from a judge, um, you get a court date. Usually it's about two to three days where you have your initial court hearing in dependency court. That's called your detention hearing. That's the first time you're going to see the judge. And parents are not allowed to see their children in that time period. So a lot of times we'll get calls and we'll hear from parents who are in that situation where my child's just been taken from me what happens next? What's what's this process going to be like? Because it's something they may never have been through before, and they're having to try to figure that out. How long is it then before the court date, after you, you're not seeing your kid? Usually about two to three days is about the first time someone's going to see a judge. And then at that first hearing, that's called the detention hearing. What What happens at the detention hearing in terms of the next part of the case, seeing your child, what happens? Yeah. So the important thing to keep in mind for a parent that's going to a dependency court is that this detention hearing is not the full trial of the case where they're going to make a final decision about whether something happened or it didn't happen. It's sort of like if you go into traffic court, your initial appearance is you're saying you're not guilty. In dependency court, you're denying the petition. So you'll get paperwork that says, here's why we think that you're in dependency court. The court has to make some initial findings. They have to figure out who the parent is, usually who the father is. They do an uh, inquiry to see if anybody has Native American ancestry. Case gets handled a little differently in that situation. And then the court is making a decision at the detention hearing to, while the case is pending, are they going to detain the minor outside of the home? Um, and that's often a very significant decision the judge is making about, while this case is pending, do we keep the child outside the home? Do we put the child back in the home? So that's what your... goes on. Yeah. And in your experience, in the vast majority of cases, they don't return the children to the parents at the detention hearing, right? Typically not. Uh, the, uh, that We do have some cases where that happens, but the vast majority that I've seen are children are taken out and kept out of the home while the case is pending. So how can we, if, a, if a, either parent hires us, how can we help the parent get the child out of that foster care place and with a family member? So one thing that can be done, yeah, so it, there could often be a big difference between saying the child's in foster care versus back to the parents. And in the middle is the option of having the child placed with a family member. So what we want to do is when we get that initial call from somebody who's facing a dependency case, we want to say in the event that the court's looking at options of keeping the child outside of the home, is there a family member who could watch this child, number one? And number two is, could that person also potentially be approved to be a monitor? So in the case where you have monitored visits, you could go over to the house where you have an uncle, an aunt, a, a parent who's watching the children, and you could be with that person, and they're supervising you, rather than having a monitor who's approved through social services. So we want to get that information when somebody first calls so we can use it later. And that's one of the first things we do so we're ready for the court date. 
right? The first absolutely. court date. That's absolutely, absolutely something we want to do. Um, it, it get screened to see who can uh, can watch a child. Another situation would be um, if you have, let's say, the, the father is being violent towards mother, if there's the opportunity for them to separate while the case is pending. We have mother calls. We said, OK, if there's an issue with dad, he can go out of the home so the children can stay with you rather than having children taken from both of you. If there, we have the opportunity to have one parent who's there, that's better than not having anybody. In these, and when we have domestic violence cases, and the, let's say the father hit the mother, um, I, it's my experience that they will not release the children back to the mother unless the mother either gets a restraining order or says that she's going to keep the father away from the kids, right? That's typically the biggest concern is if they believe domestic violence has happened, they want to see that kind of separation, either through a court order or through mom moving out of the home. So we want to we want to present that if we're talking to mom or dad present that option. In the event that there's this concern, can we have one parent who's available to watch the children while the case is pending? And also, in some cases, we may be representing the father, and he's also facing criminal charges. So he's got a criminal charge, and he's also got this dependency case going on, right? Absolutely. And that's why we want to coordinate our representation so that we're protecting um, liability in both criminal and in dependency court. And we want to have a strategy that is going to protect um, the, the client that we're representing in, in, in any court appearance. Why is it a good idea for a parent to immediately contact our office when the child's been taken by social workers versus waiting until court and maybe asking for a court-appointed lawyer? Well, one thing that we can do is that we have the time prior to court to prepare for the initial court appearance, whereas the court-appointed attorney will not have a chance to look at your case prior to court or understand what the case is going to be about prior to court. Another thing is that typically when we're making an appearance on a dependency case, we're only handling that one single appearance on that day, and we have the whole day to to prepare and, and handle the appearance, whereas, uh, unfortunately, just the reality of the system is that the court-appointed attorneys have a large stack of cases and often not the full amount of time to review everything that we would have. So some, uh, I've had cases that um, there might be 25, 30 cases on calendar, and the same lawyer is appointed on like 14, 11, 12 cases, and they don't know anything about the case, all these parents have lost their kids. They're terrified. They don't know what's going on. And this one lawyer is supposed to handle all these cases in a morning. And so much is at stake where when we're handling a case, we're almost all the time just focused on that one case. And we've had a few days in advance. And it can make a huge difference. Don't you I think? agree with that. Yes, I, I, I think that is the situation that, that happens sometimes. And, and I do agree that it's better to go in and not just get the file the same time as, as court, to have time to talk to the person before court and, and be prepared. I, I agree with that. Another thing that is very interesting in dependency court, people don't understand versus criminal court, and I'd like you to discuss it, is if you're accused of, say, physical abuse, you're accused of, of, of hitting your son or daughter with a belt and it leaves a bruise, say, on their butt, right? In you can also be prosecuted criminally, right, at the same time for child abuse, right? Yes, of course. And in criminal court, it has you have to have 12 jurors find you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It has to be unanimous, right? Yes, yes, exactly. But in, why don't you explain how the low diff, the major so, difference in dependency court? Right. So, so in, when you're looking at criminal, that's the highest standard that we have in terms of burden of proof. In dependency, we're talking about a single judge making that determination, and there's a lower standard. So it's not the beyond a reasonable doubt standard. It's what's called the preponderance of the evidence. So is it more likely than not um, that something happened? And that's what a judge is going to decide in uh, dependency court. Now, it's interesting. I think what you brought up is a really common situation for what we see in dependency court, which is um, parental discipline and, and how far can that go. And so dependency court, it doesn't, it's not 100% that you could never spank your child or you can never use any kind of corporal discipline on your child. But the important thing is to look at all the surrounding circumstances. Is it something that's not excessive? Is it something that a parent is doing to properly discipline a child instead of something that's out of anger? So we do get a lot of those cases where they're making the allegations of 
um, improper corporal discipline. And in some cases, we are able to show the social worker that this was really something that a parent was using to try to properly discipline their child. And maybe in the future, they're going to use non-physical means and things like that to get a good outcome for the parent. In some of the cases like this, uh, the cases where we're most successful is where you have an incorrigible child who's very difficult to control, and you can show that the parents have consulted a therapist, have consulted the teacher, and have gone through a series of disciplinary steps before getting a belt on them, versus a parent who hasn't done that and just gets pissed off at their kid and just whoops them, right? That's I think that's the, that's the big difference, is, is it, are you going through steps to try to discipline the child? Is this the last resort? And is this something where it's, it's not that they're doing it out of being angry? and and those cases will get better results for the parents. In a case, um, we got one minute left in the segment. So I would just like to ask you, just so people can have hope, even if a parent loses their kid, they do have a shot of getting their kid back, right? They have well, hearings. Could you explain that real fast? Absolutely. So as the case goes through, you're going to have a chance to go to a trial to fight the allegations against you if that's if you're denying what happened, or you're going to have a chance to go through services, take classes, and show that you've turned your life in a positive direction. If you have a drug issue, you can go to drug classes. If it's domestic violence, you can go to counseling to show that you're putting yourself in a position to be a better parent. And you can come back to court and a six month review hearing, right? That usually everything in dependency goes on a six month clock. So you could get your child back as early as six months. The longest would be about 18 months. It all depends on how you're doing with your case and how well you're going. Great. John, thank you very much. You obviously are brilliant at this, and I and I wish we had more time, and I'm going to bring you back on another show because so many people deal with this problem. Thank you very much. And now off to some commercials. Thanks so much. No problem. You've been charged with a crime, and now you're facing the loss of your freedom. Where do you turn to get out of jail or stay out of jail? The law offices of Wallen and Claridge. Call 877-4-NO-JAIL. With over 20 years experience and attorneys who work in your local courts, Wallen and Claridge can make the difference between jail and freedom. When you need help, make one call. Make it to Wallen and Claridge. 877-4-NO-JAIL. The call is free. Will you be? When your children are taken by social workers, it may be the worst day of your life. When will I see my children again? Where are they going? How can I get them back? Who can I turn to for help to end this nightmare? The answers to all these questions are a phone call or email away. Wallen and Clarish have been helping defend parents who are battling the system to regain custody of their children for 40 years. Many of their clients have done nothing wrong to warrant their children being taken from them. Other clients may regret some action that they've taken with their children. However, in every case, the clients desperately need their children back. That's where Wallen and Clarish comes in. They know the dependency system. They will do all they can to work to try to get your children back with you. Take the first step and call Wallen and Clarish now for a free phone consultation at 877-466-5245. That's 877-466-5245. Or visit WKLaw.com to chat with us. They'll be there when you call. Hey, are you okay to drive? Yeah, I'm fine. If you've been arrested for DUI and are facing DMV in court hearings, it could mean losing your license, your job, and even your freedom. But Wallen and Claridge can help. Just call 877-4-NO-JAIL. With attorneys who know your local courts, Wallen and Claridge can make the difference between jail and freedom. Call Wallen and Claridge at 877-4-NO-JAIL. The call is free. Will you be? When you are facing a serious criminal charge, it means you may be looking at many years in prison or doing up to one year in county jail. Most people do not know who to turn to in their time of need for expert legal guidance. What you do next can make the difference between ending up in prison for many years or having your charges dismissed and you going free. At this very critical time in your life, you need Wallen and Clarish fighting for you. Wallen and Clarish has 40 years of criminal defense experience and they work very hard to do all they can to win their clients' cases. Wallen and Clarish has a team of 10 criminal defense lawyers fighting for their clients every day. They help people with 
cases pending throughout California. They successfully defend cases dealing with murder, sex crimes, all felonies, as well as misdemeanors. Check out WKLaw.com for some real client success stories. They offer a free phone consultation to answer your questions. Call them toll free at 877-4-NO-JAIL. That's 877-4-NO-JAIL. They will be there when you call. If you are facing criminal charges, your entire future is at stake. You need to act now to protect your job, your family, and your freedom. Call Wallen and Claridge at 877-4-NO-JAIL. Wallen and Claridge has over 30 years of experience in fighting for our clients' rights. With local offices in Riverside and San Bernardino, we are here to help you now. Call 877-4-NO-JAIL or go to WKLaw.com. How much is your freedom worth? Call 877-466-5245. The call is free. Will you be? Okay, guys, we're, we're back. And I have the tremendous pleasure of introducing Mike Carrillo. Mike Carrillo is a brilliant lawyer who, defend, who prosecutes uh, for people that have been victims of sex abuse and for people who have been brutalized or otherwise taken advantage of by the police. Um, so let's start, Mike. Tell me how you first became interested in becoming a lawyer. Well, that was easy. I think my dad is an attorney. He's been an attorney for over 40 years. I think I went to law school because I thought I just wanted to continue the partying days of my undergrad. So, But it, it worked out. I love what I do. And what's the name of the firm? So we are the Carrillo Law Firm. It's me, my father, and we have three other attorneys that work with us. And where's your office located? We're in South Pasadena. Okay. And um, where did you go to college and law school? So I went to undergrad at Purdue University in Indiana and law school at Whittier Law School here in Orange County. Okay, and prior to becoming a lawyer, did you have the tremendous good fortune to intern at any particular law firm? <laughs> well, that's an easy one, Paul. I interned at your office, Paul. Oh, that's right. So tell us, when you were you in law school at the time? Yes, I was in law school, and I think in 2007, a friend of mine, a mutual friend, connected us, and I needed a job in the summer, and you were kind enough to give me the receptionist position. Isn't it hard to believe that you started at a receptionist, and look where you are 50, 14 years later? And then after you were a receptionist with us, obviously, you quickly got elevated, because I saw how brilliant you were, and then you became working right outside my office, right? Yes, started from the bottom and ended up next to the boss. So yeah, yeah. I was right outside your office. It was a great experience, didn't you think? You don't uh, have to say it you was if it wasn't, <laughs> but don't you think it was? Paul, I have a, a lot of my legal career to thank uh, you for and uh, just showing me the ropes. You know, I had my dad as a mentor, obviously, and he's still a mentor, but to see the inner workings of the business side that I didn't get to see previously, was tremendous, and you know that. I love you, Paul. I love all the support you've given me over the years, and you missed my wedding, but I forgive you for I, that. I was there. No, I wasn't. That's that's right. You could put Destiny's wedding, but I love you guys. And and Michael is a new father, so everyone who's a, who has a young baby, you know what he's going through and practicing law. It's the joy of his life. Tell me why you decided to go into the. I know your dad did it, but why did you decide to carry on and take on these kind of cases? Just the fact that you see these people suffering, you see what they're going through, and you take it home with you. And you think, do I have the power to change? Do I have the power to do something for these people? And the power lies within me. And the fact that I get to tell these people stories to juries, uh, try to get them justice for what they've been through, it really is, is uh, my life's work. And I think, uh, luckily, I have my wife to support me and backs me in all of my my cases that are really tough emotionally, but I just love it. I love what I do every day. And it has to be emotional. Representing a victim of sexual abuse who you believe 100% was victimized, um, what kind of cases have you handled in terms of that regard? Where the, who, who was the perpetrator? Like, was so it a... Go ahead. So most of our cases deal with teachers, uh, coaches, uh, after-school coordinators, 
that's most of our child sexual abuse cases. And a lot of times we get the, the kids or their families right after the perpetrator has been arrested. And so we sort of coach them, you know, tell them what to expect in the criminal process when maybe the district attorney isn't there always to explain everything. And then after the criminal process is over, that's when we, we try to get justice against school districts, after school programs, YMCAs, when they don't protect these kids in the first place. So what you mean is um, when you take on a case, you watch the criminal case, and if the person pleads guilty, um, it makes your case easier, right? Because then you're dealing with damages? It does make our case easier, but it's not still not an open and shut case. So just like the priest clergy cases, the Boy Scout cases, you still have to prove that the the Boy Scouts, the priests, the school districts, that they knew about the abuse or that they knew this perpetrator was doing bad things. So it's not an open and shut case, but it's still, it helps the situation. And it provides closure to these victims because at least they know that this person is going to go to jail. They're going to get to be registered as a sex offender because a lot of the victims, they go all the time and they look on the, the Marcy's Law websites to see, well, where is the perpetrator? Am I, am I making sure I'm staying far away from them or not? Because they're victimized and they're terrified, you're saying. Terrified, uh, and it carries with them for the rest of their lives. How do you prove with a Boy Scout case, how can you prove when they say, I didn't know he was doing it, I didn't know he was doing it, how do you, how do you get around that and actually show a jury that they either knew or should have known? So on these cases, of course, nobody's going to come out and say, oh, I saw... John Smith, and he was touching little kids in, in this room, and I knew about it, but I didn't tell anybody. It's not that easy, right? So what we have to prove is that, well, there was like grooming steps, and grooming just refers to not like your hair and your teeth. It refers to when a sexual uh, perpetrator gets close to the children or their family, uh, starts giving them gifts, special benefits in the classroom or in the after-school program or in the athletic team, and then really starts to reel them in and try to exclude their families. And then they make them seem like they're the only ones that are looking out for them. And it's okay to show love in this way. And that's what really we have to prove is that, that all these administrators for the schools or the Boy Scouts, that they missed all these red flags and they knew about them at the time. Got it. So that has to be a tremendous, when you are able to get a recovery for a victim of sexual abuse, it must make you like, I don't know, I would think extremely proud that you were able to accomplish something for another human being that had gone through such a horrible experience, right? Yes, it's great for me to see these kids go on and graduate college, become professionals, and to see that, you know, the money that we're able to get them helped in that process. And the closure that they got from getting somebody on the hook saying that it wasn't their fault it really warms them up and, and it makes me feel like I'm doing God's work, really. Do most of the cases that you get ultimately settle and avoid a trial or do most of the cases actually have to be tried? Most cases in general, civil cases, uh, they, they settle, but some we have to try. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think that's unbelievable that you do that. I want to talk before the time's up about the George Floyd conviction and the, uh, the conviction for Chauvin, and it looks like he may get 30, 40 years in prison. I think it's leaving a false impression with the public that because of that one verdict, it's easy for you to get recoveries for your clients who are being abused by the police. What's the truth about that? Sure. So I'm glad you brought that up. We do a lot of civil rights cases when law enforcement oversteps their bounds, uses excessive force, shoots and kill people, or like in the Chauvin case, they asphyxiate someone to death. And I think it is a false impression that the system is changing all because Chauvin was convicted. It's not like that. We have juries all the time that come back and say, oh, I think what that officer did was wrong, but I'm still going to believe what he said and not going to find him liable for the death of this person. I had one lady in a jury uh, a couple years ago tell me, I think that that man is a killer. Well, why didn't you vote for us? Why didn't you vote for the plaintiffs? Oh, well, I had to follow the law. And it's like, wait a minute. And so now to this day, I think still the problem is that when you get a jury of 12 people, they're still going to believe that all law enforcement by nature is good. They try to do good work, which they do, but then you have these bad apples. And so it's hard to convince these people that there are bad apples, that these bad apples did 
wrong and that they're not telling you the truth when they testified in front of you. So what you're saying, it's very hard to get a jury to believe or enough jurors to believe that police officers will actually lie. Yes, 100 percent, that police officers actually lie, that they'll cover up, that they're protecting the shield. And really, the attorneys on their behalf, they fight in tooth and nail on everything, and they try to dehumanize who we represent, the families we represent. So it's really a disgusting process for the families that try to get justice. So it's a little frustrating for me to hear in light of the Black Lives Matter movement and all of the publicity that the Floyd case got. And, you know, that people are trying to use that as an example to change policing. I'm hearing from you, we're a very long way off. Yes, I'm cautiously optimistic that the Chauvin case and the, the marches this last year will change people's opinions. Now, I personally think a lot of the asphyxia cases that we have where people were officers were lying on the back similar to George Floyd and they killed them. I think that that might make a difference to say, well, wait, officers can lie on someone's back and kill them. They should be held responsible in the civil court. But in terms of ch changing jurors concepts or their, their mind around the fact that officers can lie and they do lie to protect themselves, I still think that's a far way away. Do you think that um, if in fact you could try a case like the George Floyd case right now and civilly, do you think you could be successful in a case like that? Yes. And but isn't that because, isn't that primarily because of the video camera? Yes. Well, videos definitely help. And we have a couple cases right now pending where officers lied on someone's back while they were struggling to breathe and they killed them. But of course, the attorneys that represent the police departments all say, well, they had a drug problem, they had a heart condition. Everything that was used in the George Floyd case, they're going to try and throw at us. So yes, I would love to take one of these cases to trial. We have one set in a couple months. And so we'll see how the jury reacts on that one. Isn't it something that you, um, a lot has to do with jury selection? And because obviously they're the ones deciding and you need nine votes, right? Nine out of 12? Yes, nine out of 12. Right. So do you find, um, just, just a fact, do you find that a lot of it is has to do with the race of the jury? That you're more likely to get a positive vote on your side if the person was Hispanic or black than white? Or do you find that as a, a stereotype that's wrong? I mean, I don't know. I, I think I, I think the stereotype is wrong. I think it's it's really depends on your background, where you come from, where whether you want to believe the law enforcement. Also in federal, these federal civil rights cases, these civil ones that we have, it's, it has to be unanimous for this federal civil rights. Oh. So not just in, in state court, like what you're talking about, you do have to get the nine out of 12, but. Okay. Hi, Maria. How can I help you? Hi. My sister needs help. She has three grandkids that she loves, but her daughter passed away a year ago, and the father and my sister don't get along that well, and he won't let her visit her grandkids. She's heartbroken over this. She used to always visit her grandkids and took them places when her daughter was alive, but now she hasn't seen them in seven months. It's so sad. Can you help me out? Um. Mike, I'm sorry, but I got to take this. this is really important. Go Listen, ahead. that is very, very important situation because grandparents, aunts and uncles, when your mm -hmm. daughter or son passes away and you had a tremendous relationship with your grandkids and now the other parent doesn't like you for whatever reason, it used to be that you were sort of screwed, but that's not the way it is anymore. Like you have to, if you have a long history of a relationship with your grandkids or your nieces and nephews, and the other parent will not let you see them. What we recommend, you can always hire us or any lawyer, you get the lawyer to write a very firm letter saying that you want a relationship and you're willing to take this kind of visitation, not ridiculous, you know, every other weekend, something like that. And if he turns it down, then you file a motion for grandparent or aunt and uncle visitation, and they have to have a darn... The, the other parent has to have a darn good reason for denying you the right to visit your grandkids, which is so important when we can tell grandparents, because so many grandparents, they live for their grandkids. It's one of the saddest things we get. And so we often fight for them. And very often we win in court because it's the right thing. So thank you very much for the question. 
And I hope everyone heard that because it's really important legal advice. Anyway, Mike, can you tell me um, uh, how does it work to hire you? Do they have to pay you a huge retainer or do you do it on contingency or how does it work? Good question. So all of our cases are contingency fee cases. So you don't have to pay anything up front. We invest our time and our money into the case. And if we win, then the client gets, uh, then the client will get their money and we get uh, our cost back, of course. And so um, isn't that a gamble? Jeez. That means you can put in 100 hours on a case, 200 hours. I'm sure you'll say more. And if you don't win, you got the joy of doing the case, but you didn't get paid and you have to pay your building and your mortgage, right? Well, yeah. So the worst experience that we've had, Paul, is we uh, I had a huge case. It, it was a five-week trial in Santa Monica. The costs that we spent on the case were $350,000. Oh, my God. It's like money we put into the case, not including our time and our energy and, you know, hours and hours of taking taking depositions where you interview people and get their sworn statement. And we lost that case and I, it, it was so disheartening. But wow. But anyway, we filed an appeal and luckily we were able to uh, settle with the school district after the, the case. But that one was the probably the worst one we've, we've had so far. You know what? I know that you saw your dad knowing that I have two sons that are lawyers and your dad's a lawyer, so there's that connection also. But the fact that you saw your dad fighting for these people for so many years from the time you were a kid, that had to inspire you to do the same thing, no? Well, yeah, there was one experience I had where I was walking with him in downtown LA during a, a, a protest, a May Day protest. And this woman comes up to him, she doesn't even know him. She comes up to him, she starts crying because she sees him walks up to him, hugs him, and says in Spanish something to the effect of, you know, I've been following your cases. I love what you do. You support the community, big Hispanic community. That's what he fights for, really. And just the love and the sheer, the sheer joy she expressed, that, that's something that really resonated with me. You know what? Those kind of memories can never be erased. And the fact that you do this every single day, um, I, I love you anyway as a human being, but I love you even more because of what you do. It is just, I'm just so impressed. Mm -hmm. Any lawyer who can do what you do to help oppress people is just fantastic. And thank you very much for coming on the show. You know, you're a great friend, but you're also an amazing lawyer. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Paul. I love you, Paul. No problem. Okay, guys. Well, we're going to have more commercials and we're closing the show. Please watch us every week, 3 p.m. Tuesdays. It's going to keep getting better and better because legal power is the best. Wallen and Claridge Law hopes that you learned something about the law today. Knowing your legal rights is critical in 2021. Come back next week for more WK Legal Power Hour at 3 o'clock p.m. Pacific Time on Tuesdays. You can visit www.wk.